started today, I just want to quickly introduce ELU and myself and the topic uh, at hand today. So um, my name is Lara Safne. I'm the community manager at ELU. Uh, ELU is a next generation university. We offer competency based uh, programs in the tech field to bridge the tech skills gap. And uh, what we believe is that any uh, professional should be well rounded. So this is why we also do have a leadership bootcamp integrated into any of our programs, focusing on self leadership on uh, group leadership. Uh, on one to one leadership, uh, such as coaching facilitation and then ultimately also organizational and thought leadership. Um, and I think today's topic fits really well into uh, that focus. Uh, and there's no, I think, no better time to talk about resilience uh, and well-being and productivity than uh, this time. So I'm really excited for today. And it's fantastic to see such a, a full uh, meeting room. Uh, we do hope to, for it to be interactive. Uh, so we, there will be space for you to raise your voice, your questions, your thoughts. Uh, but again, if you can kindly like mute yourself while you're not talking, that will help everyone. Um, so of course, with the uh, global pandemic today, I think uh, we are all uh, challenged in our motivation, uh, in our productivity, in our well-being. Uh, although for some uh, or sometimes it can also have a positive influence. So today we will be speaking about how we can navigate these moments of change uh, and balance our energies for our well-being for our productivity and our motivation. And I think we have two fantastic speakers with us uh, to guide us in that conversation and to share their- Georgia Clark. So sorry. Children. <laughs> so, um, and that is I think one of the challenges, right? Like uh, working from home and having families. So maybe that's something that we can bring in the conversation. Uh, but today, let me introduce the speakers quickly. I am joined by Linda Hoops and Dorothy Siminovich. Uh, Linda, she is the founder and president of the Resilience Alliance. She is also a award-winning award author, uh, a former college professor, and she brings today with her 25 years of expertise on resilience, on organizational change, um, and on well-being. Uh, so I think we're in very, very good hands. And she will be uh, in company uh, by Dorothy Siminovic, who is also one of our global faculty members at European Leadership University um, and the uh, founder of Gestalt Coaching Works, uh, as well as training programs uh, here in Istanbul, as well as Toronto, Canada, and also an author uh, and speaker. So thank you, Linda. Thank you, Dorothy. I'm very, very excited to get us started today. Uh, so please uh, take it off. Lara, thank you so much. And hello to everybody. Uh, it's very, very exciting to look out and see friends and people who will be friends. And I'm waving and um, really, as they say, Evala. I'm very, very grateful. Linda, I want to welcome you to this beautiful community that we are a part of uh, today. And in many ways, um, also a thank you to Alper Utku, who may not be online, but is the president of ELU and has invited us and I know is watching somewhere um, through intuition or he will, he will be hearing. And I wanna invite us to this topic today, which I think is, you know, by your presence, we can see the relevance. But, you know, what I've been noticing is you cannot open an email up without getting an invitation for a resilience seminar or a resilience uh, invitation. And the reason is, is that if you think about these times, that it is really a call for us to find our strength. And so I'm going to speak for about 10 minutes and then uh, give over to Linda. And in particular, the two words that I'd like to make figural as I start is, if these are the challenging times, then how do we find our strengths, which is means to be uh, resilient and adaptive rather than fall apart uh, into what is not me. But the second word I'd like to introduce is the word prosilience which means to anticipate a disruption that I can stay creative in front of. And so what it means to do that. And I'd like to speak as um, you know, the director of training for the Gestalt coaching program in Istanbul. And in particular, I'd like to offer basically just about four slides. To, if you haven't uh, heard about the Gestalt approach, although many people on the call I know are our colleagues, from the world of Gestalt. But I'd like to offer why the Gestalt approach has become so relevant in today's world. 
Um, and it's interesting, you know, we have people from Europe on the call, and I think it's just perfect because the word gestalt is a German word, but really it means the, the picture we're responding to and the meaning we make of the picture we're responding to. You know, as we look at the world, what do we notice and what do we respond to? And where I think gestalt has become so relevant in today's day is it helps us have a theory of how to live in the moment. And why is that so important, um, including the mindset that we look through as we live in the moment? Because today, more than ever, the world as we know it, old knowledge is crumbling. And we, all of us, are called to be able to read new information in the moment, but we need awareness for that. Second thing is we need to be aware of the story of our lives and the mood that comes from the story. Do we tell a story that was given to us or are we the creator of the story that we tell? The third thing is what's the picture of leadership that we're building and acting upon? Because how do we influence inspiration in ourselves and influence it in others? If it doesn't inspire us, it's not going to inspire others. So, you know, this is where learning what, what really feeds us. And for the Gestalt approach, what we really notice that we teach is the idea of awareness with the needed action. Some actions are reflective or are thoughtful. Some actions are active. A, a reflection or a thought or a decision looks quiet, but is still an action. So there are four different areas that we invite people to become more aware of. The first one is the area, the era of ourselves. What's our self-awareness in, in terms of what's happening to us? And the reason we think this is so important is who we are at the individual level, our thoughts, our ideas, our responses, that's the GPS of how we move through the world. The second thing is what's our awareness of others? Um, because no matter what we know about ourselves, how do we co-regulate with others? We regulate our own emotions, but how do we regulate with others? The third thing is how aware are we of the context? You know, we say there's no bad intervention, but there is bad timing. So how do we use ourselves to really make a difference in the time that we have? And what's the social and the cultural awareness? You know, the one thing as terrible as this uh, corona time is, the call to innovation the call to community has been something that none of us have ever seen before at a global level. So what we say in the Gestalt approach is, what's the use of ourselves that we need to do to make the difference that we want to, to have to be satisfied? And in order to do that, so often if we're aware of something and don't take action, we will have regret. But when we take action on something that we deem is relevant, important, and in the moment, what we have is satisfaction and what we have, I call that awareness intelligence, when we use ourselves positively to make a difference. So the Gestalt approach has made very figural the approach of awareness. And where I think I said to Linda that we come together is to understand how to use our awareness, which is actually very challenging because people often aren't aware of their awareness, which we call the Umwelt. But how do we look at that? And, and I'd like to offer this, which is still kind of emerging as a new work, and that is if we look at the quadrant of to be aware and to be relaxed, what, what ends up happening from aware, relaxed mode is we feel responsive, relaxed, resilient in terms of being adaptive and not falling apart at disruption, and also prosilient, anticipating something because we're in an innovative and creative mood. In fact, to be innovative and creative corresponds, and co uh, co corresponds to being able to be relaxed. If we are aware but kind of pressed and rigid, we can still be responsive and fast. We can still be resilient, but we may be stressed. But we, may, but we over focus on delivery, which sometimes in a crisis is important, but being overly stressed and not being kind of renewed in the space of aware and relaxed, we may feel some burnout. If we are in the space of being unaware and rigid, and this is where so many people in fear find themselves, in times of uncertainty, it's hard to know what to focus on, and we may feel anxious. 
this is the place of being aroused, agitated, and really needing to have practices to be able to move either to aware and rigid or aware and relaxed. But this is the place we know that we need to provide support. And the last place to be unaware um, but relaxed is the place that I call the place of desensitization. We're calm because we're disengaged. And maybe that is adaptive in the short term, but obviously what happens in this mode is people will feel that they've abdicated their choicefulness. So this is a place people say, I'm just gonna watch Netflix. But after a week, they'll say, I really don't feel better. Or I'm eating and I'm really not happy with what I'm eating. And again, what are the practices that get people to move out to the other quadrants? And so what I'd like to just, bring, just touch on as a way of transitioning is, those of you who know our work on um, Gestalt coaching, you'll know that one of the things that we talk about is the dimensions of uh, presence. All of us have access to our own body wisdom, our creativity, our emotional intelligence, our care and connection, intuition, communication, and scanning for opportunities and threats. But in these times of challenge, it's a place of disruption that calls for action that invites us to use ourselves as an instrument. And this is a place where what are, is our capacity for our resilience muscles? And this is where I've loved Linda's work on having the dimensions and I've realigned them, positivity, creativity, prioritization, which sometimes when you're having a negative mood, just to be able to set a different priority strategically is a self-regulation. Connection, um, I love the idea of experiment connecting to communication because to experiment is to connect with the unknown that we communicate through intuition. And also the confidence to be able to meet the unknown with a sense of, I can do this. I do have skills. I, do, I have been in uncertainty before. And how do I stay uh, resilient and with support, prosilience? So I invite us to hold that as I now, with a lot of um, appreciation, transition you to my dear colleague, Linda. Hello, everybody. I'm delighted to be here. And what I really love is that so many of you have your cameras on. Dorothy talked about self-regulation. And one of the things that I've been learning as I study body, mind, and how we work through all of this is that the human um, brain responds to the human face and that we co-regulate in connection with each other and that just seeing one another's faces actually makes a difference. So um, you all, I think, are probably masters of Zoom by now and know how to turn your cameras on and off as you need to and perhaps even put interesting backgrounds behind you. Um, and so uh, I've been studying resilience for a long time and I'm just delighted to be here with Dorothy and, and share some of what I'm thinking. I'm also really excited about doing this with a group of leaders and emerging leaders because um, I think resilience is contagious. And you know we're in a world where contagion is on everyone's mind. And it's important to remember that the, that the helpful things can be contagious too. And leaders are in a particularly central place to spread resilience to themselves, to their teams, to the organizations that they work for, the people those organizations serve. And um, I had the, the, um, the good fortune to be able to do a workshop for 100 or so top leaders at um, a global consumer products company recently. And some of what, I'm sh what I shared with them is, um, is some of what I thought we'd talk about here. I want to make this interactive. We've got a small enough group that we certainly can, um, can interact uh, in the, first of all, I invite you to interact in the chat. And let's start there. Uh, if you would be comfortable doing so, I'd love you to um, go to the chat window, introduce yourself and tell me where you're here from. And one word that describes how are you today? I see some people, some familiar faces. I see a lot of new friends out there. So take just a minute and say hi. Let's see. Istanbul. Nice. Oh, 
all over the world. This is awesome. This is great. Um, I'm going to share uh, a few slides. Let's see if I can get my Zoom thing to behave here. Let's see. Share screen. There we go. All right. So, uh, so th this is the slide I started with, with the uh, leaders that I was presenting to the other day. The idea that your per personal performance and well-being is kind of the center of it. As you, as you uh, cultivate your own resilience and tap into the resilience that is within you, uh, you have the ability to, to strengthen your own performance and well-being. Of course, your teams, your supply chains, and your customers. And then, of course, the business results and the human impact you're trying to have with your business. So. That's what's exciting for me. And as I've studied resilience, so my background is in uh, industrial and organizational psychology with um, some additional focus in organizational development and organizational change and psychometrics and assessment. And so one of the um, things that I did a number of years ago was to work for a firm that was focusing on change and resilience. And one of my first assignments there was to develop an assessment around um, characteristics that help people operate more effectively during change so that we can help people build that self-awareness that Dorothy was talking about. And, and so we've built this, uh, this large data, global database of people who have completed this assessment. And, um, and in fact, we have a global community of practitioners that work with this, including several of the people who are on this call and welcome to, uh, welcome to you guys. Um, but um, what that's done is it, it's allowed us to get more intentional and thoughtful about how we help people recognize that they have resilience within them, but also recognize that resilience shows up as a set of muscles that we can strengthen and things that we can do intentionally. Dorothy mentioned prosilience. Um, I, uh, I, that's a word I, I created a few years ago. It's kind of a mashup of proactive and resilience. And, it, and it's really about how you can intentionally build your capability to deal with challenges. So, um, so let's see, you guys probably already know this, but let me, let's try one thing. If you are on a computer where you can do this, if you've never used the annotation feature on Zoom, I'd like you to try it. If you go up to the top, and you, uh, where you see that you're seeing my screen, you'll see a drop down and it has an annotate uh, choice there. And that'll give you some things where you can draw and write on the screen. So I would just invite you to try that. Find that and see if you can draw on the screen. Yeah, we, there we go, hearts and um, yes, hello. <laughs> Lots of hearts and hellos and good. Uh, we're gonna use this in a couple of different places just to play. Um, we also have a couple of polls we're gonna, um, we're gonna try. Um, so what I'm gonna do right now is to uh, ask you to uh, stop drawing, if you would. <laughs> and then um, I'm going to uh, clear all the drawings. Ah, oh, there's some more, okay. Um, and, then, um, and then we'll move on. So when I think about resilience, I actually start with the notion of, we've already done this, of challenges. And uh, what we know is that resilience is, uh, is a description of how we, how we fare as we encounter challenges. When I, Dorothy said, you know, you can't um, open an email without hearing about resilience. I actually, I think that's great. I also think it's a little bit difficult because people mean a lot of different things when they say resilience. Sometimes people talk about the individual attributes, things like mindfulness and so on that help us respond more effectively. Sometimes people use the word resilience to talk about the outcomes that we achieve. Uh, a lot of people use the, the word bouncing back and I'll, um, I'll, I'll, t I'll speak to that point in a minute. I'm not, I think resilience is more than just bouncing back. And, um, and sometimes people talk about the process by which all of this happens. So I'm going to share a few thoughts on that with you. And we'll play a little bit along the way um, with your own uh, knowledge of your resilience. Um, here's what I'd like you to do right now. I'd like you to think about a challenge that you're facing, maybe the coronavirus, maybe some aspect of it. And if we were in a room together, what I would be doing is handing out decks of, of photographs. And I would invite you in small groups to talk and to share a challenge that you're facing and choose a photo that captures your reaction to it. So what I invite you to do right now is to use that annotation tool that you just played with and identify which one of these pictures that speaks to the challenge that you're, the level of challenge that's in your world right now. Hmm. 
Yes. I see a lot of growth. I see a lot of entanglement. I see some calm. <laughs> Definitely all kinds of things going on here. It's interesting how Dip can't listen to the news anymore. Oh, for sure. Uh, sitting here in the U.S. and being just one state away from Florida where the numbers are going up hugely. It's, um, it's very challenging. Great. So the point here is that challenges show up in a lot of different ways, and some of them are exciting, and some of them are scary. But in fact, we use a lot of the same muscles, a lot of the same mindsets for dealing with the, the fun challenges as we do with the scary ones. And so what challenges all have in common um, I'm going to ask you to stop drawing now, and then I'll clear the, um, woo. <laughs> what challenges all have in common is that they use energy. Um, physical, ooh, hang on, good. Um, physical energy, uh, mental energy, emotional energy, spiritual energy. Um, and the good news or the bad news is we only have one supply of energy. So as you go through the different challenges that you're facing around the coronavirus, around the economic issues that are going on, around the racial turmoil that's taking place in the U.S. and in other places in the world, you, your energy is getting drawn on all the time. And so I'm going to put a little poll up. You know, as you think about the physical challenges, these are the ch some challenges tax us physically. We have to move things. I've been decluttering my office. Um, some challenges use mental energy. We've got to figure out like what's really happening with this coronavirus. When can I go back to work? How do I um, how do I solve this problem? How do I analyze this situation? Uh, it, you may have other challenges going on as you, uh, things that you're studying, things that you're learning, new things you're doing at work, figuring out how to teach or participate in learning online. Um, some challenges use emotional energy. Um, so this is, the ch this is the working with difficult feelings, whether it's our own fear or anger or sadness or whatever, um, as and, and then it's also working with other people's difficult feelings. And then finally, challenges take spiritual energy. So uh, uh, decisions like, should I wear a mask? Is it okay to go visit my mom? Um, how do I participate as a global citizen in some of these changes that are taking place? Everything that calls on us to connect with a sense of meaning and purpose and make choices about what we do with ourselves to support the, that meaning and purpose draws on that spiritual energy. So I'm gonna put this poll up and I'm just gonna ask you to uh, tell me which of the four types of energy you're using the most these days. Uh, so you can, you can uh, select all of the above if you want, but just tell me, give me some idea of where's your energy going these days. All right, I'm going to give you about 10 more seconds to vote if you haven't, and then I'll share the responses. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll and I'm gonna share the results. So a lot of mental energy being spent these days. Uh, not as much physical, we're all sitting home a lot. Um, although sitting in front of a screen for hours on end can also zap your physical energy as, you know, as we don't eat as well, we don't get as much exercise maybe. Um, and less on the spiritual energy, a lot of mental and emotional. And that's what I've seen with other groups that I've worked with as well. Uh, we're figuring stuff out a lot. Our brains are tired. We're exhausted um, sometimes. And um, what we find then is that when we have lots of different challenges going on, we can start to see some signs that we're feeling overloaded. Uh, so stress, communication, and so on. Um, at, in the workplace, it can lead to negativity. We're seeing illness. And so we all move into and out of states of high and low energy. I, I can certainly uh, attest to that myself. So what do we do with all of that? Well, this is a, um, this is a, a device that I developed a while back to help people recognize where all the different challenges are that they're facing. I'm going to touch on it just briefly. Um, but some challenges are short and some are long. So we can look at the duration of a challenge. Um, the short challenges are often those ones that hit us very quickly and we need to respond to and then we get past it. But there are other challenges that are chronic and that take our energy over a long period of time. 
I think many of us thought that this coronavirus situation was going to be a, a short term, you know, maybe a couple of weeks, locked down, you know, then we get past it. And now it's turning into something that at a minimum is months and maybe years. We can also look at where challenges come from. Some challenges we choose. We may choose to be on the front lines of the, uh, the health world. We may choose to be in the special forces in the military. We may choose a challenging profession in some way. Uh, sometimes we do that because it's challenging. We may go run a 5K or a marathon. Um, there are other challenges that are just part of life, you know, as we get older, as weather happens, as health things happen. And then there are challenges that are at the other end where uh, other people do things uh, either unintentionally or with bad intentions, bullying, abuse, etc., that draw on our energy as well. And so um, we can also look at then how big a challenge is. Now, why is this important and relevant? Well, the thing is, you don't run into challenges one at a time. You know, if you think about the challenges of coronavirus, just even in that little microcosm, it could be challenges of how do you deal with working from home with a spouse or partner and kids and all and pets. Uh, there may be the challenge of dealing with a, a loved one who's far away or knowing someone who's sick. There may be technology challenges. And then you have whatever else is going on in your world. You may have a divorce going on or you may have an illness of some sort going on. So when I work with people, with coaches and other people, they often use this to help people take stock of the different challenges they're facing and to see the landscape of where their energy is going in terms of the challenges that they've chosen, the challenges that are long term in their life and the challenges that are just arising. If you feel like doing so, think of one of the challenges that you're facing and draw a circle on the map and show me where you are. What's, um, what's one of your current challenges? You don't have to write the name of it, but just draw a circle. Where, where on the map are you seeing a challenge right now? Very cool. I'm seeing challenges all over the place. Some self-chosen long-term ones. You know, think about the challenge of having a child with special needs. That's a, you know, kind of a stuff happens years one. Think about um, uh, dealing with a crabby customer service representative. That's kind of a others actions short-term one. All of these challenges are um, are, are, are drawing on our energy. And, in a, and before we close today, one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to draw your attention to this zone down here of the, uh, of the short-term challenges that, that, uh, that are, take relatively small amounts of energy. I call those micro-challenges. And what we know is that micro-challenges are a great place to practice to build our resilience. We don't, it's, it's harder to, pra to practice intentionally when we're dealing with some of the big ones that take a lot of energy. But we can use smaller challenges to become aware of how we deal with challenge and, um, and become more skillful at dealing with challenges so that we're ready for the bigger ones that come along. All right, so um, I'm gonna, um, now uh, when we talk about challenges, one of the things that we can't escape, whoop, hang on. Is, is this question of adversity, because there are some challenges that really feel harder than others. All right, for some reason, my, whoop, <laughs> my toolbar is not coming up. There we go. I'm trying to clear all this stuff. And any of my co-hosts can, uh, can clear this for me if you want to. Um, it was so sort of perfect. I'm sorry? It was sort of perfect. That's how it feels. I know, the right? Challenges, <laughs> the challenges hang on. I know, right? Little challenges. Right. Okay, um, so some challenges feel scarier than others. And I'm not gonna get into all the neuroscience, you guys probably know that as, at least as well as I do, but what we know is that some challenges feel harder and when we get into that zone where we're experiencing uncertainty or loss of status, I mean, look at some of the work of uh, 
neuroscientist David Rock around uh, if we feel disrespected, if we feel a loss of relationships, if we feel a loss of fairness, all of these things can act on our brains just like the snake. <laughs> the last time I showed this slide, I had somebody annotate and they said, I hate snakes. So what we know is that when we encounter challenges that feel like that, it's harder for us to think. We can't think as clearly, we can't bring ourselves to that place of, of calm awareness, and it's harder for us to make good intentional choices about how we operate. And so one of the, as we get into what resilience is about and sort of how I think about resilience, um, the ability to deal with this side of the challenge world is really important. It's, a, it's especially important um, as, we, as we consider how we build our resilience. So, I'm going to invite you to pull up the chat window uh, in just a minute and think about who's your role model for resilience. I've got one of mine that I'm going to share with you. But first, this is how I define resilience. I define resilience as maintaining high levels of effectiveness and well-being while dealing with high levels of challenge and disruption. And we'll take that apart a little bit and start to play with it. So pull the chat window up. Think about your role model for resilience. This is my great-grandmother, and her name was Emma. And she was living on a farm in the Midwestern United States in, in Iowa. And she and her husband, my great grandfather, had a farm equipment business and they had a farm and they had a house. And, um, and in about 1927, she started keeping journals. Uh, she was sort of in the middle of her life. She had a couple of kids, but this was just before the Great Depression in the US. And so during that time, she and her husband lost their house they lost their farm, they lost their business, they had no place to live, they went to, and traveled to live with family, and then, and then World War II came. And so just watching, just reading her journals, she wrote like every day in her journal until like the mid-1950s, just before she died. But just, and, and one of the reasons why she's my resil resilience role model is she wasn't perfect. She had days when she was just really aggravated at her husband. Um, she was aggravated at her son who, was a, who uh, drank heavily. Um, she was, you know, like she, she had days when she was feeling bad about herself, but they got themselves through it. They moved uh, eventually to uh, Philadelphia in Pennsylvania and lived with um, one of their children, my grandfather uh, or my grandmother and family. And, you know, my mom was part of that. And, I see her legacy. My mom is now at home uh, alone during the coronavirus uh, after my dad died about a year and a half ago. And mom is gardening. So she's taking all these lessons from the farming community and she's growing vegetables and everything out in the backyard. And so the legacy of this woman's life um, is really part of the story. So I'm curious, tell me a little bit about anybody that comes to mind when you think about your own resilience role models. Linda, do you want hands up? Uh, so I'm just seeing it. Well, sure. If anybody wants to tell us a story, that would be great too. Dorothy, do you want to moderate and uh, find some hands and invite people to speak? I would like to invite Gulai Erkin to say a few words. Or Melissa Johnson. Melissa Johnson has a very strong paragraph. Melissa, are you there? Hi, this is Gula Yarkin. Okay. Hi there. Hi, I'm joining in from Cyprus today. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, I just said that um, my role models were my mom and dad. Um, I'm originally from Cyprus. And, you know, um, actually all the generation of my, my mom and dad, they are really a role model for all of us because um, we have, in the island, we have been uh, through a war situation uh, in 1974 and even from before. And um, they have always uh, showed us that, um, you know, it's okay, it will pass. Um, nothing stays the same. You just have to be there, do whatever is necessary and um, have faith that everything will turn okay. So they have always really been um, uh, there for us and showed us that, you know, it's, everything will be fine. Like you just have to 
uh, go, go through the difficulties and just have faith. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, okay, I, we have... <laughs> I, uh, Linda, I want to invite Melissa Johnson if you're there. Yes, I couldn't unmute for a minute. Um, I, so I mentioned um, my grandmother, Helen, um, who grew up during the Depression, and um, she lost her sister very young, who she was very close with. She, she always uh, was raised by a very close-knit family and then raised a very close-knit family. Um, and she lost her, my grandfather, um, to cancer. And then a year later, lost my uncle at 40 to cancer and then lost my mom at 56 to cancer. Um, and this woman was just, you know, again, had raised a very close knit family and had, um, you know, had her family decimated um, and was so, uh, you know, like, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Guli. Um, you know, talk to us extensively. Oh, yeah. I have lots yeah. of brothers and we have lots of cousins. Yeah. She talked to all of us just about, you know, relying on faith and family to, you know, get through it. And we take care of one another and we stick together. And, um, you know, it's something that I and my brothers relied on and losing our mom um, very young. Um, so, you know, she just was incredible. She, you know, at times would say, why would God take my family? And I just have to rely that God knows what he's doing. And I'm here to take care of this family until it's my time. And even when she died, right before she died, she was 94. And she said, I'm ready. I'm ready to go be with my family. And you, you all are okay now. Now I know I was here to, you know, see this family through. And now it's time for me to go be with my family. Um, so she was amazing. And I meant what I said about Linda Hoop. She's been my resilience guru since I was young. So I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Oh, thank you for that. And thank you for the stories and the important reminders from both of you about how many of us are able to learn resilience lessons from our families. Um, there are also people in the world, of course, who aren't able to do that who don't grow up with families that are supportive of them and, and loving. And so sometimes we learn resi resilience from other places. You know, we have um, one of the, uh, some of the research suggests that resilience in, in young kids from troubled childhoods, oftentimes just having one adult person who invests some love and regard in them, who helps them recognize that they're valuable, helps them recognize that they're important, is a key to that resilience. And so, you know, if we look at sort of developmentally how resilience builds, a lot of it is from role models. A lot of it is from people who we watch. And it's about being able to exercise our resilience muscles and to deal with challenges you know if we if we live in a world with no challenges we don't get to we don't get to build those muscles and so you know so so seeing people go through these things with with grace and uh and good results is can be really helpful so this linda, the, the, linda, linda dorothy here can i invite celine um istanbuli to say just a word since she has such a strong example oh great yes celine i invite you Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. I, I'm a bit, uh, yes, of course, you know, I, I look up to my family too, but uh, maybe just to add to your uh, comment, Linda, is it is uh, the muscle one time after the other, one challenge after the other. Um, it's just coming with practice. And, you know, I, you asked this question, and I just said, I think I am now feeling like a role model to myself. So I just wanted to share that energy with the rest of the group. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. Awesome. Being your own resilience role model, that's awesome. I love that. <laughs> so um, we're not gonna spend a lot of time here, but there's been uh, our research, the re research that my company has done and research that other people have done have shown that there are a lot of really important outcomes that are linked to resilience. So um, one of the people in my community did a, a doctoral dissertation on transformational leadership behaviors and resilience and found an association that people who were higher on uh, the different characteristics that Dorothy mentioned and that we're going to talk about um, showed uh, higher levels of, of these behaviors. We've seen relationships to job performance in different areas, to outcomes like employee engagement and change readiness. And, um, and also things outside of the workplace, uh, international students adjusting to college life. There was a study that someone did where they gathered data on resilience and, and the students who were able to demonstrate higher levels of resilience uh, did better on some of the, these other outcomes. And uh, parents of 
well-being of parents with autistic children. So, you know, lots of interesting things are, are related to resilience. So this kind of makes the argument for it being worth cultivating. And I, I don't know if I've made this clear, but I believe that we all have resilience within us. I, think, I don't think resilience is like a personality trait that you either have a lot of or you don't. I think resilience is a process that we apply when we encounter challenges and that we can strengthen those muscles and that we can more intentionally uh, bring our resilience to bear in, in different situations. And with that in mind, I really want, I've been giving some, a lot of thought to this lately, and when you think about all the different kinds of challenges there are, you know, wars and disease and aging and whatever, um, it's become clear to me that resilience is not just about bouncing back. People use those words a lot, but as, as we're all in this current situation, we know we're not going to ever bounce back to someplace like where we were before. We're going to bounce forward. But I also think that in some situations, resilience is about staying alive, minimizing harm. Um, you can all think of situations where the most resilient outcome you can probably think of is just keeping things from getting worse, you know? And then there are times, we all know that there are times when we can use challenges to grow as a catalyst for growth and learning. I have a sister who's a, sur a survivor of stage four colon cancer, and um, she for a while, she was minimizing harm. She was making sure she stayed alive. She did, then did some work to make sure that she was able to get back on track. And, and she used it along the way as an opportunity to grow and use that energy to build deeper relationships among our family, to make sure that her kids um, knew their aunts and uncles and grandparents more. So, so I think all of these are outcomes of resilience. So depending on the challenge, I think we need to honor ourselves and we need to honor the people around us who are survivors and also the people who are able to sort of keep moving forward in the face of challenges and also the people that are open and able to learn and grow. Um, you know, think about people who grew up in an abusive family when they were young, uh, they may eventually turn it around and be able to use that experience to help and bring other people along. So I think all of these are, are relevant outcomes of resilience. Um, so when we, when I look at, you know, you've probably heard people say it's okay to not be okay. You know, we need to allow ourselves to be in that place where our energy is low. I saw somebody on Facebook, uh, no, LinkedIn today that said, it's okay to be okay. You know, it's okay to be sometimes in that zone where we really are mastering all of these challenges and we maybe are feeling bad for the people who aren't feeling quite as successful. But Celine, I think of, of what you were saying, you know, you're, you're your own resilience role model and you, you are, to, you know, on many days you have a lot of energy. You know, I feel like that too, but I also have days when I'm feeling depressed. So Dorothy had her four quadrant model. I've got a different one, but it's, it's related. So if we think about resilience as um, high levels of well-being and effectiveness in the face of turbulent times, we can be in one of those zones, but not the other. So let's imagine that we're feeling good. So we're happy, well-being, relaxed, whatever, but we're not getting much done. We're not bringing our best selves to the world as leaders, as contributors, as you know, whatever our gifts are to the world. So that I think of as the slacking zone. You know, that's the weekend zone in the U.S. We're heading to the 4th of July weekend. We all kind of need some of that for replenishing, but we don't want to spend our time there all the time. Sometimes we're in the laboring zone where we're getting a lot done. We're chugging away and getting things done, um, but we're not feeling all that good. It just feels like a lot of work. Sometimes we're in the zone where we're really struggling. Nothing's going right. And then sometimes we're in that flourishing zone where we are being effective, we're bringing our superpowers into the world and it feels great. I can tell you that I move back and forth between these zones a lot, all the time. So what I invite you to do is to pull out your annotation. I think somebody already was thinking about that and show me where you are today. Just put a little heart or a check mark or a circle or something and tell me, how are you today? Hang on.
All right, so we got people in all the zones. We got some flourishers, we've got some, um, some laborers, some folks who are struggling, some folks that are kind of in the middle. And this is typical too. When I, when I did this um, with, uh, with these leaders from this other company, nobody was gonna admit that they were in the slacking zone, um, that, that, that they were feeling good but not being very productive. So we're all over the map and on any given day, you could be any place on this. So um, if, uh, so the, the goal is, you know, to move ourselves up here to feel good and be productive as much as possible. And so that involves this intentionality around building our resilience. So I'm going to clear the annotations. And move forward and talk to you about the four building blocks of resilience. I'm gonna spend most of my time on the thing that Dorothy referenced, which is a set of seven muscles that we use to address the challenges that we face. But I'm gonna to touch briefly on the other ones. And I believe that all of these are things that we can strengthen to, um, to build our resilience. So I'm gonna take them one at a time. The first one is calming. So remember we talked about adversity and we talked about what happens when our brains are feeling uh, fearful or in, endangered or whatever. Being able to recognize how that shows up in our bodies, um, whether it's the knot in the stomach or noticing that our shoulders are up around our ears or whatever it might be, uh, the ability to calm ourselves is very important. And so um, when I think of calming, it's, it's similar to what Dorothy was talking about. It's not about, this is not about relaxing. Calming yourself is not necessarily about relaxing. It's more about bringing yourself to that positive, alert, centered emotional state. Uh, this idea of self-regulation, co-regulation, affecting our gut, our heart, like the whole body brain system um, is, is, this is like the first step in resilience, especially when we're dealing with a really difficult challenge. So I invite you, I'm going to, I'm going to share with you one of my favorite techniques for calming, but I'd like you to pull up the chat and share your own favorites. What do you do when you recognize that you're disrupted? What are some of the um, the techniques that you use to calm yourself. So Linda, I'm going to read some breathing, listening to mantras, focusing on my breath, breathing meditations, go to the sea, listen to music, go out for running, breath and cycling, three short breaths, cooking, music, stretching, leave the area of breath and look at the sea or sky, read, eat, <laughs> music, listening to music, spending time in nature, um, which is actually a big one, hugging a loved one, talk to my son, herbal tea, stroke my cat, Jill Fagan oh. from Toronto. I love all of these, these are great. Yes. Drink water. Sit under the sun. Talk with a resilient person. <laughs> That's the co-regulation. Mm -hmm. uh, Qigong from Ishalai. Absolutely. That's wonderful. Um, I love that. So, um, also, so refreshing, that, re Linda, refreshing smells. Oh, aromatherapy. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. So, um, so this is a group that, that apparently... Uh, uses breathing a lot. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time. There are some groups that just don't have, uh, they don't automatically go there. So I'm going to just. Um, 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 uh, by, by the way, Linda, let me just say it's a Gestalt group. Breathing is our mantra. <laughs> so, um, so, so in, in, in my book, I talk about what I call four by four breathing and you can use any number of counts, but I like four just because it's easy to remember. And it's about breathing into a count of four, holding it for a count of four, breathing out to a count of four and holding that for a count of four. And it's really amazing the level of, of calm that that can bring you to. And teaching, we exert calm on other people. So calm is contagious too. So when we can calm ourselves, we create an environment in which it's possible for other people to be calm too. And Dorothy, there's, there's your gestalt as well. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, so the second building block, which I'll touch on very briefly, is that when we encounter a challenge, we have some choices of how we deal with it, de depending on um, what imagination we have and what, um, what level of control we have in a situation. Um, and so the three strategies basically that we use in combination are the first is to reframe the challenge. And this is the strategy of looking at the challenge through a different lens and finding a different meaning in it, something perhaps more positive or more hopeful in it. Um, in this organization I was working with, um, they are being, their supply chains are being disrupted. They provide commercial uh, products for commercial office buildings and things like that. And that world, that market is changing dramatically. So their revenues have been down and so on, but they're reframing it as an opportunity to really quickly pivot to some different business strategies, some different ways they're working. And so the leaders really are working very hard to find the, uh, to reframe the challenge as, as an opportunity. One of the examples I sometimes give on this one is reframing. I do a little bit of, of musical performing sometimes, but reframing stage fright as simply excitement, um, recognizing that adrenaline in the body just shows up how it does. And, and if I label it as fear, uh, it's, it's, it gives me a different way of thinking about it as, as when I label it as excitement. So um, this sounds simple and it, it's probably not, um, it's not complicated, but it's, it's sometimes difficult, but it's super powerful. Anytime we can reframe a challenge as an opportunity um, and, and move something to a different place on the map. You know, if you think of that um, map, um, that challenge map that I showed you, sometimes reframing a challenge is moving it from one place to another. So instead of seeing it as something that somebody did to you, see it as something that just happened just random or seeing it as something that is a lesson that you can choose to benefit from. So we can reframe in lots of different ways. Um, the other, of course, options are to change the situation, to do something to make the situation more to our liking. And or sometimes we need to accept what's going on and adjust ourselves to a situation that is that is not what we had hoped it would be. Now, my guess is that we're probably using all of these right now. Um, we're changing the situation um, around, uh, you know, staying home so that so that people aren't spreading the coronavirus. We're reframing a challenge as an opportunity to perhaps connect in different ways, and then to some extent, we're accepting what is. Now, why is this relevant? Well, you can spend a lot of time using the wrong strategies. You probably know people that try to change every situation and bang their head against the wall, trying to do things that they don't have any control over. Um, and then you probably know some people that are just accepting everything, oh, it's all for the best, and they're not taking the time to stand up and fight for the things that are most important. So being aware of which, which strategies that you're using, where you're putting your energy, what challenges you're choosing to take on, and where you're just choosing to adjust yourself to new situations is, um, can be very useful. All right. Um, I'm going to take, I'm going to move on to the third building block and Dorothy, I'm going to invite you to comment as we go about any of these, um, these muscles. Uh, uh, Dorothy is one of the people who's part of the practitioner community and she's been working on helping people use these uh, characteristics in, in coaching work. And she mentioned these. So there are seven muscles that we've identified. And this actually was the original core of the work. When I was doing this work in organizational change, we did a review of a lot of the, the research literature in, in psychology and stress management and so on, and identified a set of things that do appear to play a role in how we deal with disruptive situations. And so um, everything else has sort of been um, wrapped around this model. And these are a set of muscles, I believe, that we can develop. Um, we all have them, takes more energy to use them if, if a muscle is not so strong, and we develop these muscles through challenge and recovery. So the first muscle is positivity, and this is about identifying opportunities and hope in challenging situations. Dorothy, any comments you want to make about these muscles in general or about this one in particular? Well, Linda, thank you. The whole idea of mindset 
is becoming such a large figure in the world for people to, to use and that there's real research that it works. And very often, even when people hear that it's important, it's hard to maintain this. And so one of the things that we know is that the best of people can have low positivity and you wouldn't know it because it's an inner experience. But on the other hand, it can be strengthened. <laughs> And uh, people are always surprised by the impact of using positivity. So I just want to put it out there for people who say, I don't know if I could be that more positive than I am. So leave it there. What I will also say is that the first response many people have is, yeah, but you don't want to be too positive. You know, <laughs> you, you, don't, you don't want to be unrealistically positive. And I would say, yes, that's probably right. Any one of these muscles can be overused. Um, you know, if you are, if you, if this means to you that you're blind to anything negative that might be going on, or that you're not paying attention to very real dangers in a situation, that's not what this is about. This is really more about being able to spot opportunities to be able to find hope in situations that seem challenging. Um, if the U.S. military has a, um, has a program around developing resilience that uses some other language and so on. But one of the things they talk about is stop the good. You know, find ways to, to look at what's going well. And for those of you who are in org development work, the whole appreciative inquiry approach, this mindset of looking for the strengths, looking for what's positive. Um, the, uh, the U.S. Marines have a saying that's, that's embrace the suck. You know, it's like, just, <laughs> just embrace whatever's happening and, and just take it and, and roll with it. So um, you, know, you know what I also really want to add for many people they know the John Gottsman work that five times the amount of positivity to one negative seems to be critical for really coaching other people to shift to a new possibility. I've seen various numbers. I've seen, um, I've seen three to one. I've seen five to one. I've seen seven to one. The point is you probably can't overdo it, you know, and, and uh, bringing Positivity is contagious, but it's not as contagious as negativity. So, so we really do need to make sure that, that if we have some extra energy that we're bringing additional positivity into the situation. Um, the second muscle is confidence. And that's about knowing your own strengths and being able to use them to successfully deal with challenges. So this is a muscle that has to do with um, recognizing how stepping forward, moving into challenges, knowing what you're good at, knowing what you're not good at. But one of the most important things about this is uh, some of you may be familiar with Carol Dweck's work on mindset. At a minimum, having confidence that you can learn, having confidence that you can continue to use these unfamiliar situations as places to, to get better at stuff and, and, to, and to move into that. So um, self-efficacy, self-awareness, all of that feeds into this. Dorothy, anything that you would say on this one? Uh, yes, Linda, thank you. I just want to say to people, when anyone feels confidence, it shows up in the body, our soma. We stand differently. We breathe differently. Even our voice feels different to other people. The timber of our voice feels richer when we really feel confident. So ask yourself, am I confident and am I breathing into my confidence? And if I can't find it, what do I need to do to get there? Absolutely, and then there's the other, other way around, which is sometimes uh, standing in a more powerful posture can mm -hmm. help us create that sense of confidence. Absolutely. So grounding yourself, standing tall, putting your shoulders back, um, you know, bringing yourself to a place where you, where you, you are, are tall and taking up that energetic space in a, in a good way. So, but Linda, when you say that, this is where we can also have a, either a trusted friend or a coach to assist us, because sometimes it even feels weird to do that unless someone says, you can do that, you can stand taller, because we can, it's, it's not our habituated posture, we may need more support to stand taller. That's, that's a really good point. And, and I like your emphasis on trusted friends and coaches. You know, having partners in this work is really important too. Sometimes others can reflect back to us the yeah. things that they can see about us that we're good at or not so good at and, and, and help us recognize our own, um, our own superpowers. Yes. <laughs> so um, the next muscle is priorities. And this is the muscle of 
having clear values and using them to make choices with. So this is the muscle that is about saying yes to some things and no to others. Um, and it's about putting our energy into the things that are most relevant for us. So um, identifying and paying attention to the most important things may seem trivial, but every time, so, <laughs> so I'll tell a story. So I have a, I have a friend who, so I really like having Zoom calls because I like seeing people's faces. That's a priority for me. And so I was setting up a call with a friend the other day and she said, you know, if we do a Zoom call, I've, uh, I'd really rather do a phone call than a Zoom call because if we do a Zoom call, I have to take an extra hour and do my hair and my makeup so I feel presentable. Because one of her priorities is, is presenting herself well. And, and it really, her priority was, was uh, she didn't really wanna have to take that time and do that, so she would really rather have a phone call. So we had conflicting priorities and it was fine. You know, I said, great, let's just do a phone call. But knowing what's important to you, um, know, knowing, you know, if it's your family, making sure that you're spending time there, uh, it, knowing, not letting other people's priorities take over your world. When we're not, when we're using this muscle, um, I'll, I'll, I'll do the drill down on this one a bit. So this is the muscle that helps us say no without guilt, helps us be clear about our own values, stay on track, etc. When we're not using this muscle, we're often draining our energy in burning ourselves out, trying to do everything, multitasking, letting other people's priorities become ours. Every one of these muscles plays a role in how we use our energy. If you think about positivity and confidence, they're both about bringing our energy into addressing things rather than spending that energy in worry and rumination and and denial and avoidance and all of that. This priorities muscle is about making sure that our time and energy are aligned with our values. And I think we're all getting a lot of chance to do that these days um, and, and getting clearer about what's, what's most important to us. Dorothy, anything that you would say about, about this particular one? Such a big one, Linda. But I'd like to just say, you know, when people say yes and they mean no, that's an energy leak. When people say no, but they really wanted to say yes, that's a feeling of deprivation. And so what prioritization really allows us is to set our boundaries and to maintain our integrity so that we don't burn out, so that we're not unhappy with ourselves, so we don't activate the, you know, the victim mode. On the other side, when people know that we're clear about our priorities, it also engenders more trust which is an interesting outcome of being clear about what matters to you, also lets other people know we can trust you for this. You're looking out for your priorities. That's great. That's, that's a really nice linkage. I like that. Mm -hmm. um, so the fourth muscle is about creativity. And it should be no surprise that in dealing with challenges, the ability to open up options and possibilities is really important. What if we dig down under that a little bit, most of us can get pretty comfortable with what's familiar. And we can, we can wear some pretty deep tracks in, in our world where we sort of stay with some, um, some ways of doing things that are, that are comfortable. Um, we also, in this world these days, oftentimes tend to polarize things a lot. You know, I'm right, you're wrong. Um, it's this way or that way. We see that a lot in the American political system right now. It makes me really sad. In, in many ways, what creativity is about is living in that space in between, recognizing both and, recognizing that many options can be viable at once, not having to prematurely close off priorities, being able to sort of stand in that ambiguity without having to have closure quite so quickly, and being able to open up new ways of looking at things. So this is a muscle that we can build as well. And one of the simple ways we can build it uh, is to notice when we're saying yes, but, and instead figure out how to say yes and, so that we invite our ideas to play with each other rather than to fight with each other. Yes, but is a fight. Yes, and is a dance. Um, so Dorothy, let me just ask, because I love your commentary. Any commentary that you would make on this one? Yeah, this, well, the world needs creativity now. So this is really an interesting muscle that we have to cultivate and probably just to start also paying attention to the voice of judgment, but is a voice of judgment. If only is a voice of judgment. Fear actually is a mind, is a stop to creativity. 
what welcomes creativity is kind of playfulness and relaxation and feeling, and this is an amazing feeling, shameless. So you, if you want to get people's creativity, you could say to people, you know, if nobody's going to be wrong, what little ideas do you have? And welcome, as you say, uh, micro, welcome the little ideas that are the wind before a great idea. Absolutely. Yeah, just creating that space of, as you say, playfulness and openness and non-judgment. This is an important part of the brainstorming process, too. Um, so if you look at, um, at some of the techniques around, um, around creative thinking, around design thinking, this is a really important component in that as well. And Linda, you know, it, just for everybody on the line, we all know the experience of shame. So one of the things you could say to people is just don't think you could be wrong because shame is always waiting to feel for the person to have a shame experience and creativity needs to be more welcome than shame. Very good. Mm -hmm. So um, then connection is the next one. This is number five. And you, you all know this deep in your hearts that other people have resources and energy that you can draw on um, and can enlarge your capability to deal with things. But if you are not reaching out to them, if you haven't done the work of building those relationships and those networks, and if you are concerned about reaching out to other people, it can be, um, you're, you're missing opportunities to draw on that, that, that large set of resources that are out there. So this muscle is about building relationships and drawing on them for support. Many of us are really good at giving support, but we're not at, as good at asking for it. And many of us have our small core of people that we're close to, but don't always do the work of building that looser network of connections, those sort of what somebody has called weak ties. But those are some of the greatest predictors of being able to reach out and ask for help. It's that extended network. It's that group of people that we can reach out to who might know somebody who knows somebody. And so investing that energy in, in building connections and also uh, getting over whatever might feel uncomfortable about reaching out and asking for help. So Dorothy, let's hear, what you, let's hear your take on this one. Well, you know, uh, this is also a boundary a phenomena and that is how permeable and open do you allow yourself to be so that you can reach out to invite in. If you're just taking in and not reaching out, um, you actually will not really feel connected. You will just feel, um, you will hide more. If you're only reaching out, you will be depleted. And the other thing about it is there's also, I would say, Linda, strangely enough, a resistance very often to reaching out because shame says, I shouldn't need support. And the truth is well-being, creativity, and just plain old fun is connected to being more connected. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm an oldest child and I have a PhD. So I, I struggle with this one. You know, like sometimes I'm supposed to know all the answers. I'm supposed to be the big sister. I'm supposed to be the one who's offering the help. And so, so this is one that I've really worked on is that sense of being able to, um, to really genuinely invite other people in exactly. to be part of this. It, it, it feels scary sometimes, but, it's, but it really works. Exactly. And, the, and Linda, if you say it, can you imagine? <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. So the uh, the sixth out of seven is structure. And as we go along, I hope you're giving some thought to which of these feel like they're easiest for you to use, and which ones, which muscles feel like maybe you could strengthen them a little bit. We're going to do a little poll after we get through these seven, and just invite you to share which ones are your strongest muscles and which ones are more development opportunities for you. So structure is my weakest muscle. I'm working on it, I'm getting better at it, but this is the muscle that helps us um, use our energy efficiently by putting systems and processes in place and, and, using, and, and using those systems. So this is the one that puts, um, that this is, the, um, uh, this is the paying attention to details, this is the, the laying out step by step, this is the um, putting, whether it's technology or logic or a plan or something in place, and then really using that well so that we can um, work more efficiently on the parts that are predictable and have more energy available for the parts that are unpredictable and unexpected. So Dorothy, let's hear yeah. your thoughts on this one. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you know, Linda, I just, just said, the thought is structure, particularly for creative people, 
Structure is a bureaucratic phenomena and it gets confused with being boring. But structure is there to liberate you so that you could have more room to be creative and free. So if you construct this as I'm self-liberating to have structure, and maybe I also need more support, whether it's getting more team. I hired my famous, fantastic graphic person from Istanbul to be part of a team support for me for structure. You know, what do people need to have more structure in their life? Because it's not boring. It's a form of bureaucratic backbone. I think backbone is a good way to put it. You know, having having a skeleton to to yes. to, uh, to attach everything else to can be can be really mm -hmm. important. Um, and then last but not least, we have this muscle around experimenting. And this is the muscle that discipline equals freedom. Yes, absolutely. I mean, you look at forms of poetry. Um, so there's free verse, but that's very, uh, you can get lost in that. You know, having, having structure around like the form of a sonnet or the form of a haiku or something like that gives you some discipline that you can wrap around what you're doing. And then it gives you more room to, to use this last muscle, this experimenting muscle, which is about curiosity. This is about trying things. This is about taking risks. This is about rapidly learning from experience and getting out of your comfort zone, whether it's trying something new at a restaurant or um, God willing, traveling to another country someday when we can, when we can move around again, um, or asking a question that you don't know the answer to, or whatever it might be, and then being okay with what happens with that. Um, this is also a reminder, and I'm, I'm going to speak to you now as, as leaders and future leaders. This is a really important one in terms of creating a culture that supports resilience. There are many cultures that punish people for taking risks or for failure, which basically amounts to the same thing. Experimenting means that we don't always know how it's gonna come out. We might fail, we might fall on our face, but we get out there and try it. And, um, and when we are feeling depleted of energy, this is one of the first muscles to go. We really want to start to be safe and we, and we stop taking risks and we stop getting into that zone of curiosity. So just you know, a reminder at this turbulent time that, that this is, a, that this is a, 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 another playful muscle to go with the creativity one. Absolutely. Uh, so Dorothy, experimenting. Yes, well, Linda, this is such a big part of the Gestalt approach actually, and I think it's also a big part of all learning and innovation. So for us, I would just say that to be in the experimenting mode is to give yourself permission to be a pioneer in uncertainty and to walk with curiosity, awe, and wonder. And the reason you have to give yourself permission to fail is because if it's something is experimenting by definition, you don't know, unless you have a little failure, you can't move towards a larger success. So it's to expect a little bit of discomfort in search of a new land, a new idea, a new experience. And also really experimenting very often is to also invite a good colleague to comment on your idea, a coach to comment on your idea, to get more support because experimenting takes courage. And in a learning culture, you actually have to set some parameters. Nobody is going to comment on anyone's little moment of failure. We're only going to comment on your courage and you'll get a lot more takers for experimenting. <laughs> Absolutely. I see a comment. Experimenting is also a great new wealth definition. I like yes. that. Gorgeous. <laughs> Very cool. All right. So we're going to do a little self-assessment now. I'm going to pull up a poll um, that is about, I'm going to do two. So the first one is, which of these muscles do you find easiest to use? Uh, and you can pick more than one. But which of these ones, like, as you heard about them, you're like, yeah, I do that. That's great. I, that one's easy for me. I know how to do that. I, I'm the one people look to as a role model. So give us, a, give us some, uh, some read on that. All right, I'm going to give you about 15 more seconds to vote if you haven't had a chance to do that. Looks like almost everybody has. All right. So ending the poll now. And I'm going to share the results. So really a lot of, a lot of um, good, uh, 
responses here. Positivity, connection, experimenting are three of the big ones. Groups vary. You know, it's really interesting to see how different groups um, evaluate themselves on this. So maybe a little less on the confidence and the creativity. Um, so, but, uh, but a, lot of, a lot of strong muscles here in this group. All right, I'm going to do the second poll now, and this is uh, opportunities for development. So where do you see which of these characteristics, and it can be some of the ones that you're already strong in, uh, but where do you see opportunities for continuing to strengthen um, your muscles? All right, I'm going to give you about 15 more seconds. All right, I'm going to end the poll and share the results. So opportunities for personal development, confidence, structure. Um, so let's talk for just a minute about development. How do you go about developing these characteristics? I've become a big believer in um, building habits, in finding some little micro ways to work on practicing these things and then making them into habits. So for instance, uh, for pos let's imagine that you wanna build um, self-confidence. So that's one of the ones that came up. Um, so building a habit of maybe it's an affirmation that you take time to do each morning. Um, or maybe it's, uh, you know, once a week asking a friend for some input on one of your strengths. Or maybe it's learning a new skill. Maybe it's taking something that you've always wanted to be able to do and spending 15 minutes a day working on that new language or on playing the guitar or whatever. Because that experience of mastery, that experience of learning and development is one of the things that really feeds into this notion of our confidence. Dorothy, what are your thoughts about development that you'd like to share? So the whole idea of becoming aware of an area that you would like to develop actually already starts the permission to start developing. In particular, I look at confidence, and that is such a subjective inner experience. And we say that change starts from the inside. It's an inside job. So what do you give yourself permission to say, I'm going to focus on this? Because that's the very first thing. And then the, then the second part is to ask yourself, and how am I doing? And if you find yourself not doing what you wanted to do, again, without judgment, saying, okay, what am I aware of? I could continue to practice. Because that is what these uh, strengths, these resilience muscles really need. Practices and permission to keep trying. Uh, and, so, and your own self-support. When Celine says, I'm my own uh, resilience inspire, be your own self-coach and ask yourself, where do I need to continue to focus with my awareness, my commitment, and my practice? Wonderful. Love it. That's great. So the, the, so we've talked about the three building blocks of calming ourselves, choosing strategies, and then this whole set of muscles that we use and can strengthen. The last building block, of course, then is managing our energy. And I've become a big uh, student of this whole issue of human energy sustainability, about how do we build practices that help us plug the energy leaks, strengthen our energy, replenish our energy when we need to. And so protecting, building, and replenishing our energy is super important. When we have more challenges than we have energy and we start to get depleted, we can get into a really negative spiral. We can get into a spiral where one symptom is leading to another, we're feeling stressed, and we don't really think about that that's leading to awkward interactions with people, which leads to outcomes that we don't like, which leads to just feeling hopeless, which leads to feeling, you know, and, and we get into these spirals uh, and they're energy, drain, they're energy sucking spirals. And so part of what resilience is about is helping us slow down that process pay attention to what's happening, keep one symptom from leading to another, and move ourselves into a much more positive spiral that's really about how do I then create um, a feeling of calm inside myself and use that to engage in a positive interaction with somebody and then you know, move ourselves up into those places of, of flourishing. 
Dorothy, anything you want to say about energy and managing our energy? I'm sure you have some gems of wisdom to share here. I only hope and I say yes, but I have a sudden, I have a sudden figure that's emerged and that is time. And I'm feeling the energy in our group, Linda, that so many people have been stimulated and provoked to have more energy, to be inspired by this presentation. And I'm wondering if there is a moment for anyone to say anything directly to you on this call or for themselves before we close. Oh, wonderful. Yes, absolutely. Asking um, questions you want to ask, comments you'd like to make. Yes. I mean, we've really walked through the, the core content that I wanted to talk about. Um, and I'll, in a moment, I'll leave you with this thought. But, uh, but before that, um, yes, please. Raise your hand, speak up, go off mute. We've got a small enough group. If you just have something you want to say, please do. But, but maybe, Linda, say a word about microboost, because I actually call this the oxytocin boost. But as a way of leading into this, maybe people could give you a microboost if you explain this. I love okay, it. all right. So, so, so microboost is something I've been working on lately. Is, and that's this idea that when we have some extra energy, we can boost other people's energy, too. Whether So uh, as I've been walking around my neighborhood, kids have been doing chalk drawings on the streets um, or paying someone a compliment or just being extra nice or thanking a customer service representative, whatever it might be. Um, a micro boost is something that we do our, for ourselves or for other people that just gives a little positive shot of energy. And so I just, it, you know, I, I really, I want, this is how resilience is contagious, is by taking that extra energy that we have and feeding it back into that, into that positive. So that's, um, and then micro challenges, yes. Okay, so, I, so I'm going to just uh, stop sharing so we can see one another's faces and invite any of you to share a thought, share an example, share a story, share, share a question in the last few minutes that we have. Speak up. Just I have an observation that people are stimulated at word or a statement. We invite <laughs> you. All right. Maybe it's hard to follow, Linda, but even a word is just a beautiful state of moment. Here, you thank you for the micro boost. Um, really, I mean, we're a small enough group. If you've got something to say and you want to just unmute yourself, um, or uh, Laura, if you want, okay. if you have anything that you want to share as our uh, MC Linda, Linda's today, coming. Linda, it's coming. Hang on. Got it. Yeah, just to break the ice. <laughs> I wanted to um, before we left that muscle um, piece and talk about the development. I wanted to just bring an uh, example. I think I um, it was second half of February when I did my um, assessment debrief with Dorothy, dear Dorothy, and it was right before I started my Resilience Alliance work with Linda. So, and I received this feedback, you know, about creativity, and I'm like, oh, again, you know, I, I know, and it's <laughs> like, no, it's different. It's this creativity in times of challenge, and I'm like, no, this is not, this doesn't get better. You know, four years I've been working on that. And then Corona happened <laughs> and it was just like, okay, business smashed everything, you know, we're just, you know, Corona, <laughs> everyone knows what it is. So that's when I said, okay, let me just pull out my notes. What did Dorothy tell me? <laughs> because I did take notes and I'm looking into Prozillian's book and the Dorothy's teachings and my, all the years of work I've been doing. So long story short, um, I, I think, you know, I'm in a, in a place where I look back and I say, holy cow, you know, that was a, <laughs> that was an amazing three months. Look, look, look at all these things that I came up with and connected with people and just got, it got better and better. So I just want to say it's, um, you know, particularly the muscles that we don't think that's possible to develop, you know, with challenge and with the right support, they do develop. So I, I just wanted to share that. Thank you. That's great. So I Hi, Dorothy. Uh, thank you. Hi, Linda. Thank you. Uh, for various reasons, I was disconnected for a long time, about three years now. And uh, I needed to refuel myself. And this same webinar came along. And I think I did the best thing to join you. And uh, the connectedness 
is actually happening right now here. And I'm very satisfied and I thank you very much. That's wonderful. Amazing. Continue. I will. So. Melissa, I, you, I, you got yeah, your hand raised, yeah. Melissa? I echo what everyone has said, but I also hope um, for other opportunities to continue this. It was really a wonderful, wonderful gathering and learning and a return to exercising these muscles. Um, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate this opportunity and hope for um, more. That's, that's great. Okay, could happen. <laughs> Anybody else? Laura, any comments from you? Sure. So maybe um, while, while wrapping up in the last minutes, I first of all, of course, want to extend a, a very big thank you to Dorothy and Linda. Um, I think all of us were very much uh, inspired and energized. And I think above all, what I've really enjoyed is that I feel like I got equipped with some resources. Uh, so I don't just feel like I leave uh, inspired and, and with thoughts in my brain, but I actually feel ready to move on. Um, so I very much enjoyed the session and thank you both so much. Uh, one thing that really stood out for me today is that I don't think there can be uh, any resilience without vulnerability. And I want to thank the group also for being so open and so vulnerable uh, with your sharing your experiences and your thoughts today as well. Uh, and we do have another uh, webinar on resilience coming up in a month or so. So do follow us on our LinkedIn page. Uh, Melissa, we will share that information with you as well. Uh, we will be continuing a bit more on this topic. Uh, but again, thank you everyone. And I see some final thoughts coming into the chat as well. So if anyone wants to unmute and take that final uh, few minutes, go ahead. So I'm gonna put my email address in the chat. You guys feel free to um, send me a note. Yeah. I see a question from Mev, uh, working with young people in career development, resilience is not in our formal education system, intergenerational. Well, that's a big yeah. topic about how we help kids develop resilience, working with educators, working you know, as mentors and so on. And so you know, please reach out. That's a, another conversation worth having. Um, uh, Dorothy and I each have other venues in which we also continue to speak about these things and uh, I'd love to connect with any or all of you and um, and stay part of this discussion together. So Linda maybe one of the things that I can do is to speak a little bit about what I think you offer. I think that you offer in the Prozillion's book just such a wonderful useful gem of a book. I really want to recommend that. I also want to recommend the Resilience Alliance that you hook into resources. Linda has been unbelievably generous in her work, which is why this webinar is just so full and rich and always more. I also, let me put a plug out. I think, Linda, you should do another webinar um, because <laughs> this is just the yeah. beginning. But let me just say what needs to be said. Um, I just would like to invite you for that. I also would like to invite people to look at Gestalt Center for Coaching. We're doing a three-day workshop on how to really deliver experiments. If you want to really look at the, the art and practice of experiments, the Gestalt approach is actually very famous. And I also think, Lara, I, I really do want to thank you and European Leadership, uh, Leadership University for being, I think it's, it feels like the it place in today's world <laughs> that is now global and <laughs> virtual. It's like a wow. So I think these seminars, I, really people go and maybe write a few words about this experience on their Facebook. So people really know what happened. And maybe, uh, Lara, is this uh, uh, audio going to be available on the Facebook page? Yes, yeah, so we will be, uh, we have recorded today's session and it will be shared Great. on our uh, LinkedIn and our YouTube page, uh, along with also other webinars that are available there. So if you would Great. like to watch back or if you would like to share it with additional people, you're more than welcome to. So I would, thank you. 